Hi, my name is Sally Dowd, and I'll be presenting on the economic and ecological implications of a potential mesopelagic zone fishery in the California current. I've been conducting this research alongside Melissa Chapman, Laura Cohen, and Porter Hoagland. The mesopelagic zone is an aphotic area between 200 and 1,000 meters deep in the ocean with high fish abundance. As demonstrated in this figure, there are clear ecological connections between the mesopelagic and epipelagic zone. Predators forage on mesopelagic fauna by diving down hundreds of meters during the day or waiting until the fauna migrate up at night to the surface waters to feed on them. Though fishers from several countries have tried to harvest fish from the zone in the past with little commercial success, the growing interest by some Scandinavian countries to utilize mesopelagic fishes to supply an expanding aquaculture industry with fish meal makes the question of whether or not to harvest mesopelagic fishes relevant. One of the few regulations on harvesting mesopelagic fauna is a moratorium established by the Pacific Fisheries Management Council on the harvest of certain mesopelagic fish families off of the U.S. West Coast. There is not a large body of literature on the potential economic or ecological effects of a mesopelagic fishery operation. The first part of this study evaluates the importance of this moratorium off of the U.S. West Coast from an economics perspective. To do this, we adopted a bioeconomic decision model originally designed for the Pacific sardine fishery to examine trade-offs between harvesting mesopelagic fishes and leaving them in the water as forage. The idea behind it is that the decision to harvest mesopelagic fishes depends on the hypothetical economic value that would be gained from the fishery when compared to the altered values associated with predators after one of their prey sources has been depleted. This model incorporated biological parameters from an existing ecopath model in the California current. Ecopath with Ecosim is an open source food web based modeling program that at its core generates an ecosystem mass balance snapshot. The main equation we used is up on your screen. On the left side of the inequality, you have the potential price of mesopelagic fish as fish meal in the market. And then on the right side, you have both the commercial and non-commercial value of predators of mesopelagic fishes. Within the non-commercial value, there is the mu, which is the critical value. This is the minimum value that's required to equate the left and right side of the inequality. The critical value can be conceptualized as the non-market value of predators of mesopelagic fishes. When I refer to mesopelagic fishes in this study, I'm talking about the mesopelagic fish group in the California current ecopath model. This functional group is mainly comprised of mctopids, also known as lanternfish, which make up the majority of biomass when marine scientists go sampling in the mesopelagic zone. In total, there are 92 functional groups in this ecopath model, and 42 of them consume mesopelagic fishes. We inputted all of the input parameters besides the critical value, and we calculated a baseline critical value of $16.40 per pound per year. So what does this value mean? It means that non-commercial predators of mesopelagic fish need to jointly generate a value over $16.40 per pound a year to reverse the inequality in equation one and make mesopelagic fish more valuable left in the water's forage for their predators. One can actually compare the critical value to willingness to pay per pound values. Willingness to pay values can be found in environmental economic studies and they're often used to estimate a species existence value. Seven species in the ecopath model had documented willingness to pay values. So we converted these into a per unit value in willingness to pay per pound. You can see on the screen a sample of the values calculated for the study. The willingness to pay per pound ranged widely from 0.07 to around $254 per pound a year with a mean of $36 per pound. I've talked a lot about critical values and willingness to pay values. Now I want to relate their significance to our main question of if this moratorium off of the US West Coast is justifiable from an economics perspective. So here's how you can think about this. The baseline critical value of around $16 per pound and the average of the critical values when we considered variation in the input parameters of biomass price and fishing costs 
are all under the mean willingness to pay per pound calculated. For clarification, as the input parameters from equation one have uncertainty around them, we calculated different iterations of the critical value from varying values in the natural mortality of mesopelagic fish, the biomass of all organisms in the model, the hypothetical fishing cost of these predators and mesopelagic fish, and the price of commercial predators. Since the bioeconomic model was designed to incorporate prices of mesopelagic fish and commercial predators that were net efficient cost, and we only use the X vessel or the gross prices in our model, we examine uncertainty around the price by simulating different levels of fishing costs. Once we consider net price and applied higher fishing costs to the mesopelagic zone, the critical value lowered well below the mean willingness to pay per pound. The cost to harvest mesopelagic fishes will be higher than the cost to harvest their predators for multiple reasons. First of all, this fishery would Im involve steep cost of search, deployment of nets in deep water, and onboard processing. Also, mesopelagic fishes have been shown to actually avoid trawls, making them a bit harder to catch. So all these results together imply that mesopelagic fishes may actually be more valuable left in the water as forage for their predators than harvested through a commercial fishing operation. However, it is important to exercise caution when comparing willingness to pay values to the critical value due to the problematic nature of species existence values. One reason why the credibility of willingness to pay values has been questioned in the past is because these values are just hypothetical. No one actually has to pay them, so it could lead households to overestimate how much they'd actually be willing to pay to see a species exist. That being said, these willingness to pay values make it difficult to draw a clear conclusion on the practicality of this moratorium, and they're actually only part of the value that can be attributed to non-commercial predators. This portion of the study calculated important critical values and considered some variation in input parameters, but there is more work to be done. Not only should future work consider more sources of non-commercial value, but it would also be beneficial to examine the potential direct loss or gain of revenue from predators and mesopelagic fish if there was a commercial fishing operation, along with the feasibility of this fishing operation. So the second part of my study was using the RPATH package in our studio to simulate the ecosystem-wide effects of harvesting mesopelagic fishes. RPATH is the R-based implementation of EcoPath with EcoSim. So we decided to propagate the effects from two harvest scenarios on mesopelagic fishes. Through scenario one, we applied a 50% harvest rate on mesopelagic fishes, and through scenario two, we applied a 25% harvest rate for the years 2001 through 2050. So before I leave this page and dive into some graphs, I wanna talk about the overall trends in our results. If there was one takeaway, it is that for the California current ecosystem, harvesting mesopelagic fishes does not appear to have large ecosystem-wide impacts with the methods that we used. At the end of both scenario one and two, around 75% of all species in the model actually increased. This being said, the biomass changes were pretty small, with only 29 in six functional groups out of 92 having at least a 10% increase or decrease in their biomass in scenario one and two, respectively. Here are some graphs from scenario one, the 50% harvest rate on mesopelagic fishes. On the x-axis, you have the month, and on the y, you have the relative biomass. The relative biomass in the base scenario before we applied the harvest rate was one. So when you see biomass estimates going up to 1.10 or down to 0 0.90, this is a 10% change in a functional group's biomass. So in figure A, we are highlighting the impacts of harvesting mesopelagic fishes on marine mammals, protected species that have non-commercial value. As you can see, most marine mammals actually increased. 13 out of 15 of them did. This being said, only three marine mammals had at least a 10% increase or decrease in their biomass. In figure 1b, you are looking at the six predators in the model that had the highest economic value. As you can see, the majority of these commercially valuable species increased as well, but once again, the biomass changes were not that drastic. Next, I will cover some graphs from scenario 2, the 25% harvest rate on mesopelagic fishes. So we explored the relationship between 
functional group in biomass and the proportion of mesoplogic fishes in their diet. If functional groups had at least 5% of their diet comprised the mesoplogics, we consider them as having higher diet dependence, and those groups with less than 5% having low diet dependence. So graph A is showing those functional groups with higher diet proportion, and then graph B is showing the proportion of original biomass with functional groups with low diet proportion of mesoplogics. While 50% of the high diet groups had a reduced in biomass, only 20% of the low diet proportion groups decreased in abundance. Leeches, storm petrel, dolphins, and long spine thorny head were the only functional groups in the high diet proportion to decrease by 10% or more. These three functional groups actually had the largest proportions of mesoplogic fish in their diet in the ecopath model. A potential explanation for the minimal impact of mesoplogic fish depletion on the biomass of functional groups could be a result of diet composition. While 42 of the 92 defined groups in the California current ecopath model consume mesoplogic fish, only 12 of them had at least 5% of their diet consist of this spread. We still need to do an in-depth diet analysis to further understand why predators of mesoplogic fish increased when one of their prey sources decreased. As of now, we think it could be because euphacids and all forage fish in the model actually increase. And some predators examined in this study have notably higher predator dependence on these organisms compared to mesoplogic fish. Now I'm going to bring the first and second part of the study together. As the two models yield different conclusions, it is important to discuss a key difference between the static bioeconomic model and the dynamic arson approach. The bioeconomic model only incorporates bottom-up processes and ignores the interactions between fish and forage fish abundance and productivity, whereas the RPATH package allows for both bottom-up and top-down forcing. In order to have an approach to guide management through examining the trade-offs between harvesting mesoplogics and leaving them in the water as forage, it would be beneficial to take a dynamic approach to both the ecological and economic aspects. The results of the second part of the study do not imply that we should go ahead and harvest the mesoplogic zone just because the impacts on predator biomass were not that substantial for the California current. As highlighted in this webinar, there is so much that is unknown about the mesoplogic zone still. The results in this ecosystem will not be the same for every ecosystem, especially in those where predators depend more heavily on mesoplogic fish. Before opening up a commercial harvesting operation, it is necessary to know more about the ecology, biology, and physical properties of this zone. Thank you all so much for listening and here are my references.